Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Balanced Scorecard Institute webinar. Uh, it's called Balanced Scorecard 101, From Theory to Practice. Uh, this is a webinar we offer periodically. Uh, we, we like to go back to the basics and, and uh, give anybody who's new to Balanced Scorecard an, a, an, a free overview of what Balanced Scorecard is, what the benefits of implementing a system like this, why is it so popular, what are some of the challenges you, you, you'll run into if you just decide to go the, down this route. Uh, we'll start with some introductions. Tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about us and a little bit about me, and then and then we'll go jump right into it. Tell you about what Balanced Scorecard is, um, where did it come from. We, we're now 30 years into using Balanced Scorecard. Uh, Balanced Scorecard was invented sometime around 1990, and so it's um, you know it's been it's still to this day one of the more most uh, popular frameworks uh, used in the in the uh, performance measurement and and uh, strategic planning and management field. So I'll tell you a little bit about what a balanced scorecard is. We'll talk about benefits, the costs of, of implementing a system like this, and then what are some of the, the principles you'll need to keep an eye on if you want to implement a balanced scorecard, if you, if you want to do this successfully. We'll finish, finish up with some questions. Again, I'm David Woolsey. I'm the, the, the Chief Executive Officer for Balanced Scorecard Institute. I've been doing this for 19 years, according to this slide. It, it seems like a, a long time, but uh, uh, we at Balanced Scorecard Institute, what we do is we help people with performance measurement and strategic planning. Uh, we, organizations of just about every kind of every, every type that, that you can think of, uh, we've helped with their planning, map, figure out what they're trying to accomplish, develop consensus around a, a picture of, of, of of success, success, and then uh, map out their uh, the actions needed to make that happen. I'm based in Cary, North Carolina. That's where their, our headquarters is. Uh, again, we we are now all over the world. Uh, here's here's where where we are here in North Carolina. We have an office of convenience in Washington D.C. We have another office of convenience in San Jose, California. And then the blue stars you'll notice are, are our partners. We partner with organizations all over the world. So if you're interested in in uh, becoming certified and balanced scorecard, uh, you can probably go to, you'll, you'll probably find somebody nearby that, that, that offers a uh, one of our programs. Again, as I said, we offer certification training and consulting services related to everything from strategic planning, balanced scorecard, KPI development, strategy execution, OKRs, or anything that's, that's related. Just a couple of notes. As you probably saw when I got started, we I, we are recording this webinar. We do share that recording so that you you can send that out to uh, to folks or, or or come back and watch it later. Uh, that just give us a day or two to to process that. Uh, within forty eight hours, we should send that link um, for for the uh, the recording. Uh, we will also will I'll try to reserve some time for, for at the end for uh, for Q and A. Uh, if you just put the, the, your questions, if you think of them along the way, put them in the QA box, not in the chat. Uh, and when we, we get to the end, I'll try to answer it. as many of those questions as I can. Usually, we have 500 or so registrations. Usually, there's you know, 3,000 questions, and we don't get to them all, but I will get to the ones that are that, that, that seem to be um, uh, common concerns anyway. All right, with that, let's let's jump into it. Um, before I tell you what a balanced scorecard is, let me ask you a couple of questions. Let me make sure I, I always like to have a sense of um, where do you stand at the, it, 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 is, is this brand new for most of you? Uh, we often have a few people come back and uh, you know they're they're just they want to review things. So on a scale of one to ten, is this something you've never heard of? Being one, and uh, at the other extreme, you know, if you're a certified consultant or something and you're just here to, uh, to 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 learn more about how we approach things uh give yourself a 10. okay i'm gonna launch a poll uh, i'll give you you know let's say a minute or so go ahead everybody uh, tell me where do you stand on this okay and i as usual there's a mix we do have quite a few people that are this is brand new and we have a couple of certified experts so and then everything everything in between Okay, it looks like uh, we're up to about 70% participation. I'm going to give you about another five seconds. All right, and here's the results. If you didn't get to it, it's that's fine. Um, so it looks like we've got seven of you. This is brand new. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, looks like maybe 20 or 30 of you that this is relatively new. 
And then at the other extreme, there's just a, a handful of people that, that you, you think of yourself as certified experts in this. Okay, cross the spectrum. Where did Balance Scorecard come from? Again, like I said a minute ago, 30 years ago, it's crazy that how, how, how time flies. 30 years ago, uh, Dr. Robert Kaplan, he was at Harvard University, uh, and David Norton, who was a consultant, worked together uh, with a consortium of companies to try to determine how to measure performance as an organization. How, how do we measure organizational performance? And they found back then, of course, that most companies were using financial performance as their primary, if not only, way of measuring success. Okay? They found that this was very short term thinking. They tended to, pay, companies tend to think about what they're going to, the bottom line, quarterly results. And that tended to be the only way they knew whether, whether they were going to be successful or not. And there was a lot of those organizations that were not terribly successful in the long haul because they weren't thinking about long term strategy. They weren't thinking about, um, all those non financial I issues that are, that drive quality that make customers happy. Um, they were not thinking about the connection between the lagging indicators that they're ultimately trying to achieve and the leading indicators of the things that they think might be driving that success. Um, and they, you know, it, it, we, 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 it was a changing world as it is today. In 1990, the, the world was changing from uh, where you could capture the, the value of a company through uh, a, by looking at the assets to an information age in which a company's value might be very different uh, depend, you know, even though there might not be any tangible valuable value. Um, so it, as the world changed, it, it was it became more important that we look at the more you know learning and growth types of elements that could actually be an indicative of value in a way that was very different than in, in, in the industrial age. So they dubbed their new system the balance scorecard. Uh, the first article came out in 92. First book, this one, uh, trans, uh, Translating Strategy into Action, came out in 96. Uh, and ever since then, Balanced Scorecard has been one of the most popular frameworks uh, in the world to, to use uh, in the management space, the st strategy management space. It has evolved over the years. The, that first initial version was really was fo fo focused almost entirely on performance measurement. But over the years, it became more of a planning and management framework. That, that organizations use to articulate what they're trying to accomplish, and then, of course, measure success. Okay, so we're, we think of it as a system now. It's a planning and management system, and, and a system like this is used to communicate to employees what we're trying to accomplish. What is our mission, vision? What is our strategy? Let's make sure that all of our key stakeholders understand what we're trying to accomplish so that they can then align their work with, you know, in, in, independently, we can align their work with whatever it is we're, we've decided is, is our mission and strategy. Independently, I can also, as an employee with, at an organization with Balance Scorecard, prioritize. I can make decisions about which programs, projects, services, and so forth I, I should be focusing on based on what our strategy is and, and what our, the measurable results are that we're trying to achieve. And then, yes, over time, it has continued to be a very, very effective way to manage performance in a strategic manner. Let's make sure that we've articulated what our strategy is, what are our objectives, and our, the, the things that we're counting should be relevant to that strategy. Okay, some of the basic components that I want to make sure that I'm connecting dots include things like my high-level strategy elements, like mission and vision, um, core values, things like that. Um, Break I, if I create those high level elements, I can break them down into objectives. Uh, that's these these ovals on our, on our strategy map. They are continuous improvement outcomes we're trying to achieve. I visualize those using a map because most people are visual, and it's and it's better to it's easier to understand what my how my strategy works if I draw a picture of it instead of just writing a long narrative. And then of course I've got the measures that track performance, and then the targets are the desired level of performance I, I, I am trying to achieve. And then finally, uh, on the right side of our of our strategy, we, we usually list our strategic initiatives. And these are the projects that help me uh, close the gap, achieve the objectives that I'm trying to, trying to achieve. 
one of the signature concepts from that original Kaplan and Horton scorecard is, is something called a perspective. And that is the idea that we are no longer going to only look at financial performance. Of course, financial performance is still important. We're just going to add on to that uh, consideration of what the customer is looking for, whether they're satisfied, what are we going to do to retain them? Um, and then our, we, we move internally and think about our processes, make sure that, that, that we're focusing on quality, efficiency, effectiveness uh, of the internal processes that we're using to drive external value. And then we're going to move into what they call learning and growth. We tend to call the organizational capacity perspective, where we look at all those elements re related to human capital, tools, and innovation, infrastructure, culture. Those elements should enable me to develop, you know, to deliver more quality services and so on. So this original concept of, of perspectives helped um, frame the conversation around performance for any organization that uses a balanced scorecard. Okay, here's what a scorecard looks like. We, in the balanced scorecard world, like to capture our strategic plan on one page. Okay, so this is a one-page balanced strategic plan. You've got an element, elements related to communicating what I'm trying to achieve. At the top here, we've got mission and vision, and we've got some focus areas. We like to call those themes, but you know, some, some frameworks call those goals or uh, high-level priorities. The point is you've got a limited number of focus areas all driving what objectives you choose. And so the left side of the screen, this is called a strategy map, and this captures the cause and effect chain of, of elements that we're going to focus on in order to achieve our strategy. Okay, so this, this captures the story of value cre creation. In the middle part of our screen, I've got the measures. Okay, so every single one of these objectives on the left side has a measure. Okay, so I've got profits, I've got profit as my measurement, and then I've got a target that determines what is the level of performance that I'm aiming for. Okay, so this middle, middle part captures the performance measurement element, and then the right side of the screen are the initiatives. Initiatives being the projects that I'm implementing, start and stop type projects that are that are designed to help move the needle. Okay, so the actions that I'm taking are over here. And then finally, the bottom part of the screen is the, um, again, back to communicating the, the, the values or the ethics that, that are important for the organization. So with a scorecard like this, I should be able to connect the dots. This, this is based on a, 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 an energy company that I, I, we, we all work with. Um, they were implementing a new, a new strategy related to consulting. Okay, so they, they had this thought leadership objective that was driving consulted, consulting knowledge sharing. Um, we've got new products, we've got awareness, all that driving revenue. So anything on the right side of this screen had to do with that new strategy. The energy leadership strategy it even showed up in their their mission statement going forward and so they they had some initiatives that they were implementing they were at thought leadership committees and a, and a, a, some, a research expertise strategy they had a study set, set of, of measures we, um, what kind of, how many articles have we published and what, you know let, let's measure the new product sales etc et all of those measures tied to the same strategy and the point is, is that if I worked at this organization, I could connect the dots between all of these different elements. Okay, it's a, it's a way of organizing your thoughts around and, and getting everybody focused on this, this new strategy. Okay, and so again, my entire strategy is organized around these four perspectives. The financial perspective is usually pretty straightforward. Most people understand that this is about how we create value. If I'm a, if I'm a business owner, I'm creating value for owners. If I work in the government or nonprofit, we're talking about maximizing mission value and effectiveness. Okay, are we are we uh, maximizing um, consume the, the 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 tax dollar if I'm working the government and so forth. If I, then I move into the customer perspective and I put my I look at things through their eyes. How are, how well are we meeting their needs? Are you know are they are we are they satisfied? Are they, are we reta retaining them? Are they loyal? There there might, might be lots of different ways of measuring success in that that category. Within the internal process perspective, I've now moved internal in inside the organization. I'm I'm asking myself how are we delivering 
efficient services, quality of services. Are we faster, cheaper, better in some way or, 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 or not? Um, and then at the bottom of the, my, my um, strategy map, I've got organizational capacity or the original name, learning and growth, where I'm asking myself, what kinds of tools and, and knowledge, skills, and abilities, capabilities am I, am I building so that I can in turn develop, to, to, uh, deliver better services? Okay, so down at the bottom, we're talking about human capital, we're talking about the tools, technology, innovation, culture, and so forth. And I've already touched on the fact that these things are connected. Um, I can build capacity so that I drive improved internal processes, which in turn drive results. Those results take the form of either customer results or financial results. You'll notice these arrows here that's an indication that sometimes we actually change the order of the perspectives. If I work in the government or I work for a nonprofit, I might put the customer perspective at the top because we're not we're not ultimately trying to drive profit for shareholders. We're maybe all ultimately trying to contribute value for a stakeholder. You'll also notice I've talked a lot about various strategies that we're trying to implement. The energy company I talked about uh, had a had a energy leadership strategy that had to do with consulting services and such. That is more of a vertical consideration as opposed to these 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 uh, perspectives which have that the, the horizontal consideration. Okay, and so th those themes, those strategies, can take lots of different shapes and sizes depending on the strategy of the organization itself. Uh, you know, an example might be operational excellence might be uh, or a strategic partnering, build the business. There might be lots of different strategies that an organization will try to implement. Uh, we call those themes. Those are the major focus areas of the strategy. For each one of those themes, there is a strategic result. So it's crystal clear to employees, if we have an operational excellence theme, what success looks like. I want to make sure that I create a goal that is cr concrete, and, and, and documents what um, what success looks like within the operational excellence theme. So we all agree as to what success looks like. <clears throat> Another key element is the strategy map. Again, most people are visual. So if I can take my strategy and, and, and instead of writing a long narrative, long paragraph of, of words that describe what we're going to do, if I can paint a picture of it, more people will get it. They'll understand what they're talking, what, what we're trying to do. And, I, and the way I read a strategy map is I ask the if-then question. If we as an organization can improve knowledge and skills and we can improve technology, it will enable us to increase efficiency. If we can improve process efficiency, that could help us drive lower cycle time. If we can drive uh, cycle, cycle time down, it will improve wait time in the eyes of the customer, which in turn helps customer retention. You know, and th this is a, a simple academic example, but um, you know, the, I could definitely see how maybe th this is the reason why our customers are happy or not, why why they they give us their money. Efficiency also drives uh, lower cost. Cost revenue drives profitability. So this is a basic story of if I'm sitting in a training class learning about process improvement, I now I can now see a picture of why I am doing this. If I'm an owner of this organization, I can also ask the question in a different direction. I can say, how? How am I creating profit, a profitable business? I'm focusing on these contributing factor type objectives. Work my way down. Okay, so the story can be told either bottom up or top down. Uh, and the point is that I want my employees, you want the, the employees on your team to um, learn this cause and effects story they want you want them to be able to, to develop it themselves when they are focusing on something i'm trying to achieve this outcome and i want to be able to articulate what the what the could you, the story is for driving that success another key component to doing this well is understanding what we mean by performance measures i can't tell you the number of times that i have had somebody tell me We've, we've created a strategic plan and the measures are not very good. Can you tell me what's wrong? And they show me their, their performance measures and their measures are nothing but a series of milestone type projects that they want to implement. 
when we talk about performance measures in, balance score, in the balanced scorecard world, we're talking about something that's quantifiable, something that you can count and track, like this trend line right here. I can trend it over time because that way I know whether I'm getting better or not. Okay, something that I'm count number of something, the percentage of something, the rate of something, something that's countable. So we're not talking about initiatives. It's not that we're going to redesign the website by the by the end of June. Uh, that's that might be a very important action. It might even be a, a strategic initiative, but it is not what we traditionally think of as a performance measure. Another important concept in balance in, in the balance scorecard world is the, the idea of creating alignment through cascading. This is where I create a balance scorecard at the organization level that, it, that includes all of the pieces I've just shown you, everything from mission, vision, values, high level themes, results, strategy map, measures, targets, and initiatives. I create all of that at the organization level, and then I translate that into each of the the units within the organization. So if I've got departments, they each create a scorecard. If I if I go into business units, support units. So I might be sitting uh, with the HR team. Now, if I've got a large enough organization, the HR is, team is creating an HR strategy map, measures, targets, and initiatives. And the idea is that the initiatives or the, the objectives on that HR scorecard are aligned with the objectives at the organization levels. So I can demonstrate how we are contribute, contributing to the success of the organization. We can we are contributing to the strategy implementation. And then at tier three, we're talking about creating alignment between teams and individuals and those tier two scorecards. Okay, so I, I, I don't I won't necessarily create a strategy map for each individual, but I would have you know, in the HR system, uh, in, in the evaluate when I do my evaluations, I would probably have personal objectives, each with with some measures and some actions I might need to take that are aligned with the strategy of the organization. Doesn't capture everything that an employee would be doing, but it does capture the highest, most important um, elements, most strategic elements that I, I would be working on. All right, so if that's what a balanced scorecard is. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits. What is it that we're trying to achieve with this? I've already touched on a few of them, but uh, let's talk about the benefits and the costs. What, what, what are you getting yourself into uh, when you decide to go down this route? Okay, another, another poll question. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Okay, so this one gets at, um, do, do your employees understand your organization's strategy? Uh, and one, uh, again, we're, we're using a scale of one to 10 on all these. Uh, a, a one says, well, nobody understands our strategy. And we're, we make up, make, we're making this stuff up as we go. And a 10 is perfect. Everybody understands everything that we're trying to implement. There's, we have no problems in this case. I'm not sure why, why, why you'd be on the webinar, but it sounds like you got it all figured out. Let's, um, let me launch that one. Where do you think you stand now? And we do have at least one person who says no one understands anything. This is this is we're we're in trouble, and nobody nobody gets it. Nobody knows knows what we're trying to accomplish. And we have a couple of people again. We got we have, I think we have a couple of consultants on the line. Everybody understands and aligns. We've got we got this perfect. All right, we're almost to sixty percent of you. Again, it's always a mix. Um, most people are are somewhere in the middle. It looks like a twenty five percent of you coming in so far are at about four. That's pretty typical. Um, four tells me that you know we we're trying. We're we're uh, we've we've got a few things in place. We we all understand what our mission statement is. We get, we we we've got that printed on a card over here. Um, I've got a I, I've got some goals that, that that you know maybe we have some high level goals, but maybe we have some alignment issues. All right, so let me stop the poll. I'll share that very quickly so you can see where everybody stands. This is pretty typical. We've got some people who are really wrestling. We got a lot of people in the, in the middle, and then very few people that are actually uh, at the at the at the top end. All right, we've got another question, <laughs> and I just minimized that window. Let me see if I can find it. 
Okay, now we're talking about measurable goals. Same, same kind of question. Do you have measurable goals? What I mean is, um, we are trying to go from $2 million as a company to $5 million as a company. We've established that as a written goal, as a, a quantifiable goal. How many people understand and could tell you what uh, what we're aiming for in a, in a quantifiable sense. So 10 is perfect. We have a list of those. Everything I do is measurable. One is we have never even talked about having a, uh, a measurable goal. So let me launch this one. Pretty similar to the last question. It looks like so far nobody nobody has put one. Okay, that's interesting. So, uh, even, oh, there, there's one. <laughs> Spoke too soon. All right, so I, there, there, I think if I am doing the math right, there's a, a few more of you that have measurable goals than than uh, than uh, answered positively on the last one. Oh, everyone! Wow, you guys are quick on that one. I'm going to share real quick. You can see that uh, five of you have everything. Articulated. Okay, so so that these are folks that are either consultants here to here to take our slides, or you're um you're uh, you're just really good at this on, on the measurement side, and maybe you needed more help on the on the uh, measurement side. Uh, but again, it looks like uh, no, five was the one is the category that got the most votes. Okay, so what are we what are we aiming for with in terms of benefits? We're aiming for transition. This is this is transformation. We are, you know, the organization maybe looks like this when we start, and when we finish, we are aiming for something like this. This this is the the vectors of energy that that each employee it brings to the table, brings to their to their job every day. And I have worked in organizations in which you have this big green arrow here. This is somebody who comes in early and they stay late and they work really hard but their perception of what you're trying to accomplish is different than what the organization wants it to be. And so their work is actually counterproductive. Uh, they, they, they think they're doing good work, but they, they just don't understand where we're actually aiming. So you're trying to correct that. This is somebody that you want, you want the, all that energy pointed in the same direction. Okay, so when we talk about alignment, we're talking about, you know, this is the more more elaborate way of telling that story. So you've got mission and vision, all the elements that go with high-level strategy, values, uh, political priorities. You know what is it? You know what is it that our stakeholders really care about? Let's take take all of those elements and create strategy out of it. Make sure that strategy is driven by these elements, and that it's coherent. It's it's understood. We, un, we you know we, whether we call them themes or goals or something else. This is what our high-level strategy is, and that's driving the objectives that show up on our strategy map. And everything else is driven by those objectives. You know, we have a strategy map, we have measures that are focusing on that, targets, initiatives, department objectives, employee action, employee objectives, and then ultimately actions. Any action I take, so when I start talking with HR about my reward system, it should be aligned with my objectives. If I'm talking about what initiatives I wanna implement, if I'm talking about what I want to spend money on, all of those actions should be driven by ultimately what I'm trying to achieve in my strategy and the, and the objectives. Okay, so this is, you know, the, ultimately the benefit here is not just getting visual uh, alignment on paper, but getting your employees to develop consensus around this alignment. What is and what is not consistent with the objectives we're trying to achieve. Another benefit I'm aiming for is to get employees to connect dots. What I mean by that is we have leading indicators, we have lagging indicators. And I want employees to be able to articulate for themselves and for their team that, hey, we're holding these smoking secession programs. Those are designed to drive down the percentage of people that smoke. And the percentage of smoke people that smoke is driving down cancer rates. I mean, you know, this is this is pretty obvious you know, not get for, as, a, as a teaching example, but if you work in a company that um, you know produces nails and, and you're, you're trying to improve the, the quality of the nail, then, then you want employees to say, hey, if I sharpen the tools, it will dry, you know, make the, it'll make for better nails. And then the nails will help, uh, you know, construction workers do their job better or whatever the story is. 
we want employees to be able to articulate this cause and effect story. It's very powerful to get them to do this. So we're trying to, by implementing Balanced Scorecard, you're trying to teach people uh, to, to implement that kind of thinking. So if those are the benefits, what are the challenges? The challenges are almost all opportunity costs related to the time and the energy and the resources uh, that it takes to implement this. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to over. Or I'm not going to um, ignore the fact that it does take effort to implement something like this. You, it, you're you're going to be much more successful if you build buy-in with senior leadership, and that takes some energy. Uh, you do. You'll be much more successful if you have broad representation in the implementation of this. That takes time. Most organizations can't just shut down for five days and and, and build this out. Uh, it, it has to happen in you know in, in four hour increments here and there, uh, and so the, the the time to implement something like this is is not something to overlook. You do have to have workshops, and it does usually some training is is needed. Uh, you know whether you take one of our programs or you just go online and learn, uh, and you can have champions or you maybe you have you have a consultant or a facilitator come in and help. Uh, but that all of anything you do on the, those lines do uh, does involve uh, some costs. And challenges. Okay, so it's not, and it's not just the champion. Usually, the participants at least need some overview training, such as this webinar. All right. So, building off of that, what are some of the principles of a successful implementation of the scorecard? And of course, I've got another another poll question. Um, on a scale of one to ten, how disciplined has planning been for you all? Let me find the poll question. And again, it's similar to the last question. If you're making this stuff up at, as you go, put yourself out, at, maybe score yourself a one or a two. Uh, we, we don't really have any discipline at all. Uh, and the other extreme, we have some sort of a framework. I mean, it doesn't have to be a balanced scorecard, but we have, we have a framework that's very consistent um, and we are very collaborative. Uh, we include everybody. So that, that, that second category is more of a 10. Okay, let's see where you land on this one. Okay, again, it's a mix. This time we only have uh, three perfect scores and it uh, looks like two, two folks that are at uh, this uh, score to one. Again, it's a mix in the, in the middle. Let me uh, stop the poll. I'll share it very briefly. Okay, so we have five. You know, it looks like the, the, a six was the highest uh, ranking score. So, you know, it, 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 the folks that are online are a little bit more interested in having a structured approach to planning, perhaps. So we've self-selected ourselves into a, a better score here. All right, that's it for the poll questions. So. What's the key to implementation? We've been doing this for 30 years, and, and I noticed that uh, Dr. Alex uh, Tause and Puya Tabesh, sorry if I'm butchering their names, you're online, <laughs> but uh, they they uh, wrote a paper on the 30th anniversary of Balanced Scorecard, and it was about what lessons learned have we have we collectively uh, gotten from from the balanced scorecard experience does it work or not is what they're really trying to get in a, in a quantitative sense can it be provable that it works and they did find a positive influence uh, a relationship between implementing balanced scorecard and firm success uh, you know mathematically they could prove that there was a that there was a benefit to implementing it now there were some caveats they found that it the implementation mattered significantly, uh, that there were a lot of organizations that implemented Balanced Scorecard poorly that did not get any results. And so it really did matter. Uh, number one, they said, don't skip the strategy map. But the number of people who call our office and say, hey, I, I implemented Balanced Scorecard, uh, but we're, we're not getting much out of it. And I always say, well, show me your strategy map. And they say, oh, we skipped that step. Don't skip that step. That is, that is the the step where you communicate to your employees what you're trying to accomplish. What is the cause and effect story? Uh, so don't skip that step they found. And, um, and leaders had to be engaged. Um, I have had a couple of examples over the years where somebody said, boy, I love balanced scorecard. I want to implement it, uh, but my boss hates it. 
<laughs> and so I'm going to try to implement it in my, you know, in a small area, or I'm going to try to go around and go around my boss. That is a really, really tricky thing to try to accomplish. You really do have to get the team on board. As soon as people figure out that the boss is not on board, um, the, 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 the enthusiasm for this will go away. Uh, and so you really do have to get people engaged in the process. Uh, especially at the leadership team level, they they, they have to have be visibly engaged in the process. Uh, this team also found that broad participation and communication empowered effective implementation. I mean, that, that's what we found over twenty years of doing this. You really do have to have. It can't be a smart one smart person going off in a corner and doing this on nights and weekends. It really has to be a team effort. It has to be a conversation. If it's a conversation, you're much more likely to be successful with this. Okay, so of course we have a, a methodology that we use with our clients. This is what we teach in our class, uh, our classes. Um, it's a nine-step methodology that we use. Very disciplined. It does matter that you start with step one before you get to step five. I mean, you, you really do have to follow the follow the order. There's a logic to it. First, we as assess our current environment, then we build out strategy. Then we talk about objectives, map those, and then we talk about measurement. A lot of people want to start with the measurement step. Um, that you know, balance scorecard is really more about articulating what you're trying to accomplish than it is just about measurement. And then we, we identify and prioritize initiatives, and then we roll that out. Uh, then there's then there's ongoing ex strategy execution elements related to uh, and analyzing performance, creating alignment, cascading, and so forth and then um, evaluating on a regular basis. Uh, the point is to use a disciplined process, you can adapt all of this to, your, to, to fit your culture. As we found with, with that paper, inclusion and ownership is a key element here. We're talking about you know, this, this classic Chinese proverb, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I may remember, involve me and I understand. You can't just present your balance scorecard to your employees. They have to be part of a conversation to develop it for, if you really want them to, uh, to engage in it and buy in to whatever it is you create. Um, if it is a small team, you know, I have seen CEOs go off and create them by themselves, and then they come back and they try to present it to, to people. That it is owned by that executive team, that executive that creates it in that environment. They're, people are not likely to buy into it. Similarly, if you hire a consultant, if you hire me to come in and create your balance scorecard for you, that's not likely to, to be successful because people will think, oh, that's just that, that's that's David's scorecard. I, we, he doesn't know my business. He doesn't know what I do. The, 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 the most successful way to do this that we've seen is having a cross-functional team represent you know, the organization and build this, build out all the pieces you know, as a team. Um, it's that cross-functional input that you you need in order to uh, to develop buy-in from all the right people. Okay, so this usually involves a series of teams. It usually involves having a, an internal champion. Sometimes you have two champions, a, you know, may, maybe a more of a logistics type champion and an executive champion. Sometimes you have one person. There's lots of different ways to approach this. Just make sure that whatever approach you do, that you think through all this before you get started. Um, usually there's a leadership team involved, and then there are there are various people, depending on the size of the organization. I mean, if you have seven employees, you're not going to have all of this. Uh, you, so ad adapt this depend, uh, based on the culture of your organization. Uh, but you might have a team that focuses on communications. You might have teams that focuses on cascading in each unit. You might have somebody who focuses on objectives and KPI development. Maybe you build out themes out with individual teams if you if you're a really large organization uh, the point is is that you have different people think through how, how you approach the team um, your your uh, implementation and I'm not going to read through all this the point is is that there's a very disciplined process that we teach in our classes that can be adapted to match your culture okay so when we work with the, with the, the team usually there's some assessment work that happens there's a a, the, the leadership team or the strategic management team gets together and they talk about mission and vision, all those high level elements. Uh, then they hand this off to, to lower level teams in some cases to build out the themes, think through communications, and they come back and they do strategy mapping, then they develop some KPIs, they finalize that scorecard, and then they roll it out. 
before they start doing any of the tier two cascading. Yeah, again, we don't use the same model for every client. We adapt it depending on what makes sense uh, for your size and organization and, and your culture. A lot of people call and they'll say, where do I get my software tool? Well, the software is the whole balance scorecard. Uh, balance scorecard. Balance scorecard does not require software. Software makes it a lot easier. Uh, so so you know, maybe uh, the, the appropriate automation tool is Excel on your network, uh, but that'll be much more challenging for you than if you just go buy a, a tool like this spider strategies tool that we like to like to show. Uh, th this this makes it much, you just type in the type in your information or maybe you connect it to your system. It shows you uh, a, a tra chart automatically that's that that, it, that it includes scoring rel relative to your targets. Uh, it makes it much easier to to um, visualize. I can, I can visualize my strategy map. Each of these objectives is color coded by the by the performance. Um, I can uh, maybe run a report that shows me just all the all the measures that are in the red, so that we can have a, a quick conversation about what we're doing about utility rates and customer satisfaction. Um, I'm standing in line at Starbucks and I pull up my phone and I can very quickly see how I'm performing on something. Uh, so any of these any of these tools will work on your phone. That, that, that just um, if you're implementing a balanced scorecard and you want it to be easier, this is this is a, an important part of the conversation. <clears throat> you're also uh, making sure that your employees can connect the dots between different different types of performance measures. That's what this is. system is designed to enable. So I've got inputs. Maybe I've got a coffee store, and I've got measures around the the cost of the beans, or the you know the the, the how much water I'm using, or time, or you know the, the cost of my employees. There's all kinds of inputs that I'm investing in my coffee business. Then I've got process measures that, that focus on the efficiency of coffee making. Are, are the baristas all following the same procedure? Okay, I, that, that might be key to producing the right outputs, which is coffee that people want to drink, that they like. So I have the outputs that I produce, ultimately driving outcomes. Okay, outcomes being happy coffee drinkers, we're making money, people are buying it. Okay, so the idea of having a, a system like this is it helps me connect the dots. Okay, so I don't have just one measure of success. I have several measures of success. And the, the ones on the left side are driving the ones on the right side. I, I really do want to know where, whether we're making money. How do I know whether we're getting better or not? Well, we're making better coffee. We're getting better beans. We've, we've, we've inc improved the quality of the beans coming in. Whatever it is that's driving your quality, you want to be able to connect the dots. Even, even connect dots there. I have intermediate outcomes that are happy coffee drinkers, sales, and then I've got end outcomes. Maybe in this case it's profitability. Okay, maybe I'm maybe I'm my my the prices are too low, and so I'm, I'm I've got lots of sales, but I don't have profits because you know I didn't do the math well. Uh, the point is is that it's really useful to be able to connect dots uh, across your system. All right. So then, the final, finally, um, one of the primary benefits that a lot of organizations tell us they get out of this is the the ability to prioritize in a systematic manner. In other words, they come to us and they say, "I've got 340 initiatives. It's too much. How do I say no?" Okay. So this the, a system like this enables you to say, uh, you know, we've got the all these candidate initiatives. Let's use a systematic process to down select the most important initiatives that are tied directly to my strategy in a, in a, in a uh, prioritized order. All right, 245. So that's, that's, that's it for the content. If you do want to know more about the process, uh, there are, you, you might look into our certification programs. Like I said, if you, you know, you can implement this either, you can go get our book, just get a book or read about it online and try to do it yourself. That's a valid approach. You can send a few people to a certification class like this, this the Balance Scorecard Professional class program. They do learn the entire methodology. Uh, and then, you know, of course, we have a couple of other strategy execution programs. We have an OKR uh, certification program. Similar, it's a different methodology, but it's a similar kind of thinking. You could also go down the, the consulting approach. And that is, you know, we, have, we offer services 
uh, of all types of services related to, to consulting and facilitation to help you uh, with this. This particular one that you're looking at is called Quick Start. This is where we just come in for a handful of days, maybe a week, and get you started. Mm -hmm. So that we do some training, we get you started, and uh, you know, we go through each of the elements very quickly. You're not gonna be finished in five days, but you will be pretty close. You know, you, you will have gotten started and, and you'll, you'll be far enough along that you can then go offline with your team and finish it up. So, so this is a, a popular way to, um, to implement this. All right, 246. So we have, a, we have a few more minutes. Let me look over and see if anybody has any questions. If you do want to know more, uh, just you can find our balance or go to balance scorecard. Sorry, Carlos, I don't speak Spanish well enough to, to answer your question. All right, so I see a question about from Samuel, what is the difference between strategy and the strategic initiatives? Okay, the strategy, when we use that word, we're talking about the broad concept of trying to move from point A to point B. But we want to, where, where are we now and where, where are we headed? What is our plan for getting there? That, that's what we mean by strategy in, the, in a broad sense. The initiatives, strategy, strategic initiatives are the, um, the projects that I try to implement in order to move the needle. So a project, any project is something that I, it's a coordinated effort designed to produce a particular deliverable, right? It has a start, it has a stop. So uh, any project could be strategic if I thought of it as something that was cross-functionally connected to, to, to a strategy I'm trying to implement. So that's what I mean by a strategic initiative. How do you measure themes? Uh, the, if theme is the definition of, I wouldn't say that, that a theme is the definition of, of success. I would say that a theme is a focus area. So I, I, my strategy is made up of three or four different focus areas. I got operational excellence. I'm gonna do some partnering. Maybe So maybe strategic partnering is a strategy. Uh, maybe I've got one on um, uh, culture change and, and so forth. Those are broad focused areas that make up my strategy. And then I measure success usually by having some sort of measures tied to it, whether my strategic results should capture, in essence, what success looks like. But the, the objectives and the measures that are tied to that are going to really capture whether we're, whether we're successful. Um, sometimes I'll have like an overarching strategic result that have a measurable element that tells me, you know, like maybe tied to my vision. Um, it's very common to, to tie as a as a as an organization, we're aiming for some some high level outcome. Um, yeah, I see a couple of questions about the software. I see some questions about communication. If the organization is so it is so wide. How can we communicate to the expected level? You no, know, and I know one way is using email communication and, and Zoom. Yeah, I mean, in other words, what you're getting at, Elimu, is how do I communicate? How do I manage um, performance over time? How do I communicate over time? In other words, we in, in our classes, and I, and you know, in a short webinar, I don't kind of get, get into this. In our classes, we talk about the strategic review process, where um, we start with start as soon as the planning is done, we communicate broadly what the balance scorecard is. What are our objectives? You know, what, what are the initiatives we're implementing? You know, what does our strategy map look like? I communicate that broadly, and then I translate that into a regular set of performance review meetings. So once a quarter, say we get together and we say, "How do we do? Did we achieve our objectives? Are we hitting our targets?" Uh, are we implementing our initiatives? Is it making a difference or not? And that, so that so the communication happens initially uh, with a pro program launch, and then it happens on a regular by by continuously um, reviewing it and and, and and updating things over time. And that gets to the next question. This Andre asks about frequency. We are very structured annually, but not structured with quarterly reviews. That's, that's, so that's what I was just getting at, exactly. Um, 
you know, for, for some organizations, quarterly reviews is too much. I, you know, I've got, I'm trying to big accomplish big things. Uh, maybe it makes more sense for me to, to give myself more time. Maybe I have three reviews in a year, maybe a two reviews in a year. If you're waiting an entire year, it's probably too infrequent. Um, you know, you did a lot of time, a lot of things can happen in a year. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite stories, I, I was working with a, with a company that had a, a bonus program. Um, and they launched the bonus program in January, or they said it was going to be like a Christmas bonus. And in February, they made some financial decisions that that were clearly going to undercut the bonus. And everybody knew it, the entire company knew it, and they spent the entire year with employees grumbling because they knew they were not going to get a bonus because they had invested all this money in, in, a, in, a, in something else. Um, so they had a lot of angry employees at the end of the year. <laughs> so you have to be very careful about about doing structuring anything on an annual basis only. You know, and I and I mentioned OKRs. The OKR world is much more likely to be uh, to to shorten that time frame. Let, let's you know the world the world is changing too fast for us to have a five year strategic plan, and we just don't really adapt that over time. We just we just implement that, and we hope hope that things you know don't nothing happens you know we COVID happens you know right something happens that's going to drastically change our, our strategy what you what you want in the okr world what you're trying to do is make sure that on a regular basis you get together and you might change entirely your your entire system of okrs there's not any reason why balanced scorecard balanced scorecard can't be implemented with that same kind of agile mind frame of we're going to reevaluate on a regular basis whether it's quarterly or semi-annually or something, we're going to regularly, regularly evaluate whether things have changed and we need to adapt. I see a question um, about the, uh, are there studies that you can recommend that, that uh, provide a comparative analysis of different approaches that compare balanced scorecard with other approaches to develop KPIs and so forth? Uh, you know, there's not been a, a lot of studies like that. The, the one I showed in the slides are, are about as, as close as you're going to get to a quantifiable um, a quantifiable assessment of whether this is effective or not. Um, I will say that in terms of comparing methodologies, you, you want to think through what works with your culture. Um, most of these frameworks, again, I mentioned OKRs, balanced scorecard, they 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 rely on some of the same principles, you know. I, I um, I, I've heard Paul Nevin say this, and Brett Knowles, and some of the other, some of the OKR folks all say, you know, balance scorecard, KPI. They're, they're made up of the same DNA. We're doing roughly the same thing. We just we're calling things, uh, you know, we're we're um, we, we we might have slightly different terms and so forth, different methods. The key is, are the principles there? The principle of Am I, as a team, articulating what we're trying to accomplish? Are, are we doing so in a way that, develop, that we can develop consensus around that? And then are we measuring success? We're measuring progress. Are we um, keeping track of the initiatives and, and connecting dots? Those are the kinds of principles that any framework that you would implement should be reliant, should, should, should be built around. Um, so you know, in, in terms of what specifically which, which methodology is, is better, I, I think it's gonna really depend more on, on those principles. See a question about the number of objectives. We have, we have when we have developed the strategy map, we arrive, we arrive to among 20 to 12 strategic objectives. How could how could have just five key strategic objectives? Given that the, I'm wondering if you thought that one of my teaching examples, we don't typically see five objectives. We typically do see say 12 or, or, or 14 objectives on the organ, organization level. If you cascade into departments, you might be, see fewer than that. Um, I'm not sure where you, what, what you mean by five. Are there drawbacks to balance scorecard and how can they be countered by anyone pushing back in the organization? Um, there's, a, there's a few, that, you know, when it comes to the drawbacks, it's, some people think of it as too time consuming. It, it does take some time that I was talking about the costs. You know, it, it does take some time to, to implement this. 
Um, I think that it has that there has been there have been accusations over the years that it's too structured, maybe a little slow. But that to you know the, the OKR folks will say that it's too slow. But but like I just said, I don't think that there, there's really any reason why balance scorecard can't be adapted on a regular basis, just like the OKR like OKRs are. Um, so I'm not sure that's really necessarily a valid uh, issue. Uh, there are some readiness issues, and, I, and I've seen a few questions about that. In other words, are we as an organization ready to to implement this? Um, the issues there have to do with um, maybe we were just acquired, uh, you know, or we're about to be acquired, you know. And, I, and I'm trying to implement strategy, but if, if this new company that acquires us, that that's going to be a drastic change. Probably not the right time for implementing something like this. Uh, maybe we've got a new CEO that's coming in and in two months. Probably not a good time to, to try something like this. In other words, major change initiatives. We're trying to implement three new major changes at the same time. Maybe balance scorecard isn't, isn't the right fit for that at this point. Uh, lots of questions about return on investment kinds of things, uh, uh, financial benefits. You know, that that paper I showed you, they try to get at the quantify, you know, a, a exact quantification of the benefits. But I, I will, I always like to emphasize the, the real benefit of this is getting a team in a room and talking about what you're trying to accomplish. That we, we get, I get more comments about that than, you know, a quantifiable difference. Wow, I've worked here for 20 years and nobody has ever, we've never gotten in a room and talked through, you know, what what, the, what would measure a measurable success look like? You know, how, how would I measure success? Uh, you know, what, what, should our, what should our goals be? Um, th those kinds of conversations are really, really useful for most teams. You know, and, and hopefully it also does drive the success the way the paper was getting at. Uh, but a lot of organizations indicate to me that that's really the, the benefit. Okay, a few questions about our classes. The, the classes are both uh, live online. They're offered out, a, a live in person. Uh, so you can go to Washington, D.C., take our, our, our class, be standing in front of a, um, you know, a consultant will be there in the room with you. That's probably ideal, uh, but I, the, our classes that are out live online are the same exact content, the same exact exercises. Uh, you're just, you're on Zoom like this. I'm not sure it's quite as as strong, but it, it saves on the travel. Uh, we do not offer uh, streaming classes yet. I, it's we still feel like there's a lot of value in having a, a consultant sitting there answering questions. I, it's just it's hard to recreate that with a, a streaming class. What's the difference between KPI and OKR? That's a very that is a very very uh, tricky question. Uh, OKRs are objectives and key results. Right, so you have the objective. The objective is the same, whether it's balance scorecard or K KPI. It's the same exact thing. It's an objective. That's what you're trying to achieve. It's a continuous improvement activity. The key result in the OKR model is a, quant a, a measurement and a target embedded in one phrase. And in balance scorecard, those are in two columns, the measure and the target. <laughs> so to a certain extent, they're the same thing. Um, the, the biggest difference, though, is the way they're, they're handled. OKRs tend to be implemented in short term and they're, they're in terms of what am I going to try to get done this quarter? This quarter, I'm going to try to increase our revenue by, or increase our sales by 20 percent. That's my goal. So I, I measure, I use my OKR as a, as a target setting exercise for that particular quarter. And KPIs tend to be trended trended more long term. I hope that makes sense. They're they're they are so similar that it's really hard to to, to differentiate without really getting into the way they're the, the way it's they're identified and, and implemented. All right, it's three o'clock, so we're, we need to wind down. Like I said, there's about two hundred more questions here. I didn't get to you. Feel free to, to reach out to us at Balance Scorecard. Work. If I didn't get to your question, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to set up a call to, with somebody if you're interested in, in learning more. 
thank you again for attending the program. We uh, we uh, will have another one of these, and actually, we do it in a couple of weeks. We have one on our our, our new artificial intelligence rollout a set of programs that we're rolling out. So um, hopefully, I'll see you in a couple of weeks on that session. Thank you again. We'll see you next time.